Look, I'm spending a lot of time on smart contract risk because it's so important. And I want to go through uh, a couple of exploits uh, to kind of show you the steps. And indeed, I'm doing this on purpose because uh, it reinforces some of the concepts that we've covered in the first three courses. So you see this uh, in action. So to actually go through an exploit um, kind of uh, reinforces the material that I've been going through. So uh, this is um, this is a hacker. So again, this gets a lot of attention in the media. Uh, basically, hackers attack China's DeForce uh, for 25 million um, in Ethereum. So it's using a vulnerability in ERC um, 777, and let's kind of uh, go through what actually happened. And here I'm I'm actually uh, quoting the press. So this is um, DeForce. Um, it's a Chinese decentralized finance protocol. Lost 25 million of cryptocurrency uh, with a well-known exploit of an Ethereum token. So money was drained this morning from the contracts of LendFMe. Okay, so a lending protocol that's part of DeForce a collection of DeFi protocols. So the site for LendFMe is now offline. And basically the funds were sent to DeFi lending protocols, Compound and Aave, and uh, about 10 million of the funds were sent uh, to uh, Aave. Uh, and um, that's Stanny who's basically making uh, this statement. So, uh, this is, again, a well-known uh, type of exploit. Um, and, and we've talked about these exploits uh, before. And, uh, and, and basically, what I'd like to do is go um, into a little more detail as to what uh, actually happened here. So there's a Uniswap attack. Um, and it took advantage of this uh, 777. And the way that uh, this was set up that um, the hacker was continually withdrawing the 777 funds from Uniswap before the balance updated. So remember that? So that's exactly what we were talking about uh, before. So gradually draining the contracts. So um, this is, uh, you know, there's DeForce, um, even though this sounds really similar uh, to what we talked about uh, earlier in the course, it is kind of uh, similar. So take a look at what happened uh, to DeForce, that you can see the total lock value. So total lock value, remember, that is the, the liquidity that is, is pledged, uh, and it goes to zero. And what's kind of interesting, maybe funny, but... Um, the hackers actually sent some money back to lendf.me um, and attached uh, and attached a note. And you can put metadata into uh, these transactions. So you can put a message in if you want. And the message was, better luck next time. Okay, so interesting. But this is the most interesting uh, part. Okay, so I want you to uh, really appreciate this because I think it is a, a, a very deep comment. And this is from Robert Leshner, who is the CEO of Compound. So basically, Compound we've gone through in considerable detail. So LendF.me basically took that code. Okay, so they can take the code because it's open source. But there um, was a report in the block, which I think I've mentioned is a very high quality source of information that I get every day. Um, and what the researchers at the block actually did was to, lay, to take a very careful look at the LendFMe um, code. And they were surprised to see uh, four different references to the word compound. Okay, so, 
So what's going on here? So I want to read this quote uh, by Robert Leshner. If a project doesn't have the expertise to develop its own smart contracts and instead steals and redeploys someone else's copyrighted code, it's a sign that they don't have the capacity or intention to consider security. So let's unpack that. So the first thing is that he mentions copyrighted a code. Well, it, it's really hard. This is open source. So people copy this code all the time. So maybe you can apply for a copyright uh, in the US, but this is a global uh, situation. So let's kind of like delete the word copyright. But everything else he says is spot on, in my opinion. So you've got a group that likely is unable to put a smart contract together from scratch. They grab the contract, make some minor changes to it, and they're off and running. Okay, so Robert Leshner's point here is, is a good point, that you need to have the internal capability. And I'm okay with, uh, with forking and, and, and to some degree the vampirism where you actually go and grab uh, some code that's out there already and make an improvement upon that. That is a strength of the DeFi space. But when you've got a situation where somebody grabs the code and basically can't even be bothered to look at it and take the references out to compound. So these are like comments in, in the code. They can't even bother to take out the references to compound. That's got to be a red flag. And the risk is realized. Okay, so let's talk about another one. And this is one of my favorites. Um, if, and again, this is a, an exploit. I'm not calling this a hack. Okay, this is a very elegant uh, exploit. So Yearn is a yield aggregator. So we've talked about this uh, a number of times in the course. Um, in the third course, uh, we talked about this and the second. This idea that there's various different protocols where you can uh, earn a savings rate. And you can basically deploy your, your asset and uh, earn a rate of return, but you also get an equity token, which represents your share of that liquidity. And then you can redeploy that uh, equity token and uh, essentially create extra return. And then we've also talked about the possibility of arbitrage amongst different protocols uh, using flash loans in terms of rates of return. So uh, the example I gave was refinancing a loan. That was the first example of the flash loan, where we had a rate that was high, another protocol, it was low. So we could use the flash loan to actually refinance at the lower rate. Well, it goes the other way too, in terms of when you're actually depositing uh, the money. So you want to actually get the highest possible rate of return. So there's a number of companies that are kind of optimizing and making it easier for the user. So the user doesn't need to worry about uh, writing um, a transaction that has multiple steps with the flash loan and all this stuff. Let's, let's give that task to somebody else and they can find the best possible rate of return. And Yearn is in uh, that uh, category. So it's a nice uh, business idea, and uh, I want to go through what actually uh, happened. So this is uh, a situation where about um, 2.8 million are stolen by the attacker out of uh, a total loss of 11 million. So this is a complex exploit. So I've shown you a few exploits that are basically five steps. 
this exploit is 161 steps. Okay, so it is a great example of what uh, is possible in terms of uh, both uh, decentralized finance, um, arbitrage, and uh, exploit. So this is what it looks like. Um, and uh, I want you to notice the timestamp line where it says one day, 49 minutes ago. So when I actually did this, this exploit happened while I was teaching in person. And I had to talk about it uh, in my class. So it happened kind of uh, before the class, a day before the class. And this is just the screen grab uh, from Etherscan where you can see the transaction hash. You can see um, the address of at the very bottom where that is the uh, Ethereum address of the Yearn YDI exploiter. Okay, so this is uh, the transaction. And if we go to the actual details of this transaction, you're going to see that many of the names are familiar to you. And I'm showing the first 10 lines here. So look at the very first thing that happens. We're going to borrow um, 116,000 Ether from DYDX. Okay, so this is not a small borrow. This is like a major borrow. This is like $200 million uh, flash loan with no collateral whatsoever. I'm not going to go through all the steps, but you can see that it follows kind of the same sort of thing that we're going to take um, some ether and uh, supply it to compound. And then from compound, we're going to borrow die. And then uh, we're going to borrow somewhere else. We're going to repay um, and then just keep on multiple steps. Look at the players here. DYDX we talked about. Compound we talked about in great detail. DAI. USDC. Um, Ave is at the bottom. Uniswap. All of these companies are protocols we've actually uh, talked about in the course. And again, this is the first 10 steps of this actual transaction. So you can see 161 token transfers, and I'm just showing uh, a small amount. Um, you know, and you can see there's other stuff that goes on. We see some wrapped ether. Um, and uh, in other uh, things, we see some tether. Uh, we haven't talked a lot about Tether, but even Tether is in play here. And uh, this is, again, enormously uh, complex, very unusual, with 161 uh, different transfers to basically do uh, arbitrage amongst uh, different uh, protocols and, uh, and the exploit um, very successful. So again, this one I don't call uh, a hack. So uh, for me, this is, uh, this is somebody that has spent some time to figure out the complexities of this space and has taken uh, advantage uh, using the tools that are available to anybody. So again, it is to me that this could be, uh, this could be anybody. Uh, this could be uh, somebody in high school that has no capital uh, whatsoever that starts this off. Uh, with a $200 million loan. Okay, so it's very, very uh, powerful. So uh, the bottom line here is that we call them smart contracts. And usually I don't like things that have smart uh, in front of them uh, as an adjective, because often they're not smart. So smart contracts are just algorithms. And with any algorithm, uh, it could be high quality or it could have a flaw. The key thing is that once you deploy, deploy with the flaw, it is set in stone in the Ethereum uh, blockchain or any blockchain. We did talk about this rewriting of history. I seriously doubt that will ever happen again. This was very early on in Ethereum. So Ethereum was new. 
uh, and they knew that there would be some uh, growing pains, and many people basically gave them a pass uh, in 2016, but the probability of that happening again today is pretty close uh, to zero. Okay, so uh, we're almost done uh, with this module, but there's one more thing that I've kind of talked about indirectly, and you might hear this lingo called a rug pull. So let me end with that. So this is what a rug pull is. Um, you create a token and you launch it on a DEX. So you launch it, you put in some money, uh, which might be USDC or something like that with equal amount to this brand new token. And you start talking up the token, saying it's a great token. Then you also offer a very high reward for supplying liquidity, like really high. So let's say that you could get 4% for supplying liquidity, let's say in MakerDAO. And this new uh, token, uh, you can earn 14% or 20%. So, so people actually start to put money in, um, and when the money comes in, the price of the token actually goes up. Okay, so as people commit, the price goes up. And then, at some point, the rug is pulled. And basically, what happens is that uh, the people behind the token just dump all of their token. And that will drive the price um, to zero. And it doesn't start at zero, though. It starts at the high price that these retail investors have actually created by contributing um, and buying uh, the token. So uh, this is something that you need to be aware of. Uh, it is another risk uh, of DeFi. And indeed, some of the exploits that we've talked about effectively are doing something very similar, that at some point, they will uh, get out. And I've got a few more examples of this. In particular, I have an example um, with uh, the, the true uh, USD. Uh, and a rug pull that happened there that was very uh, dramatic. So again, with a new token, you need to be very, very careful. It's got to be vetted. Uh, and don't be misled by interest rates that don't make any sense. So if somebody's offering a 20% uh, rate of return, you should be very skeptical. So in just regular finance, if you offer 20% rate of return, there's probably a good reason for it. It's because it's really risky. And it's so risky that the company might fail. So, so beware here. It is a risk.